Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dwight Pledger and Dan Smith, and we are D&D &D Training and Coaching Solutions. Mm -hmm. And we're so excited and happy, glad to be here. And we definitely want to, want to give a shout out and thank Che Brown and his amazing team with the Comeback Champion Summit. All right. Okay. I love that sound. I love that name. Got a great ring to it. So today, Dan and I are, again, we are trainers. We um, pretty much specialize in the area of helping and you know, emerging and veteran speakers to uh, hone in their signature stories and their core message. So today we're going to be pretty much in workshop mode, okay? Um, Dan and I have, you know, we, we meet on a weekly basis in terms of, of a call, and we pretty much limit our conversation to a story. And clearly in this conference, and this summit, you're going to have just about every topic covered, okay? So when it comes to the story piece, <laughs> we got you, okay? All right, so we're looking forward to that. Now, just a little bit about our background. Dan and I have been, uh, you know, in D and D training and coaching solutions for about ten years, and uh, it's been just an amazing journey. Prior to that, though, we were part of Les Brown's Platinum Speaker Program. Matter of fact, we still are. And what that amounts to is, is that we had uh, many, many trainings, uh, many events with Les Brown, traveling with him uh, nationally and internationally, and sharing the stage and just really getting to be up close and personal with him. And I don't have to tell many of you that are on this Zoom that he is an amazing and phenomenal trainer, mm -hmm. speaker, par excellence, and now he just mm -hmm. authored a new book. So we've, we've, Dan and I met about three years after I, I joined. Dan came around. And so we hooked up and uh, we became D&D &D Training and Coaching Solutions. So today we're talking on the subject of the power of three-dimensional storytelling, okay? You probably haven't heard that term lately, but <laughs> you know, hopefully you'll hear more of it today and then begin to tell, you know, tell two friends and they'll tell two friends, okay? So D&D &D Training and Coaching Solutions, we're talking about the power of three-dimensional storytelling. Now, what is three-dimensional storytelling? Well, one of the things that happened while we were being trained by Mr. Les Brown is he would have a quote that he said he credited to Elsie Greenwood, okay? And Elsie Robinson, right, that's who it was, Elsie Robinson. And that quote uh, simply said this. It said, things may happen to you and things may happen around you, but the only thing that ultimately matters is what happens in you. Okay, heard that quote many times, and I said, oh, that's a powerful quote, but I never really froze the frame, and we should do that sometimes with these quotes that we be going, going through all the time, instead of just regurgitating them, we ought to think about what they're actually saying. This particular quote caught my attention because Dan and I have been working with speakers, and we work with all types of speakers, and some of them are what we call two-dimensional speakers and storytellers, and some, actually, without us training them, they go to that third dimension. And that's the part that where it talks about what is happening down on the inside. You know, many storytellers uh, limit their storytelling to kind of, you know, when they talk about what happened to them, they basically give you some factual experiences that, you know, that happened to them. And those are good stories. Or if something happened around them, they will share that. But a lot of speakers are reluctant, for whatever reason, to give us a feeling state, to let us know what, in, in relationship to that experience, how did it make you feel? Okay, it's kind of like we're getting on the therapy couch here, all right? But we found out that when you go down beneath the surface and begin to bring up those things, remember, we say what comes from the heart has a tendency and a way of touching the heart. There's a lot of truth to that, especially when it comes to telling your story. So we, 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 we determined that, um, and this is the other piece, and Dan may say a little bit about this as well, is that when we talk about three-dimensional storytelling, most people can tell another person's story, like in our trainings. 
Les would kind of help us out sometime, and he would basically take our story and go ahead and tell it back to us for a teaching and a learning point, which is valid. Okay, so we would do that. But here's one thing that Les could not do. He could not go three-dimensional with our story, even though he is a phenomenal storyteller. Why? Because the feeling state and, and how that experience impacted a person is really something that is unique to them in terms of that information. So we like to go way down deep and bring it from deep so that they can go. And this is the last point, and Dan probably has a couple of things to say, is that we are transformational storytellers. We are transformational mm -hmm. trainers, which means that our, our goal is to be um, speakers and storytellers that are not only um, tickling the senses in terms of the gray matter and, and getting people excited about whatever it is we're talking about and painting the picture, but we want to get down into the heart where decisions are made in terms of making changes in our lives for the better. So we're transformational storytellers and we're transformational trainers. Anything you want to add to that, Dan? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, you made a great point when you said, if, if Les Brown cannot tell your story better than you, and he's a phenomenal speaker, and why is that? It's because he did not have that experience. You're the one that had that experience. The only thing that Les Brown can do is interpret the story that you told, and he can add to it how it made him feel. You know, and and I, off, I often say, when you talk in 2D and you, and you talk to logic and you do that, you talk to somebody's mind, they'll think about what you have to say. But when you talk to their heart, when you give them from your heart to their heart, they yeah. will act on what you have to say. And you're the only one who can tell your story. No yeah. one else can tell it because they did not experience it. Even if you were a twin and did identical things every single day of your life, you still, each of you had a different variation of the same experience. That's right. I love that. So, and a lot of times, one of the things about going three-dimensional, as we say, or going 3D, that you'll hear us say from here on out, is that um, many people have things that are a part of their story, their signature story. And we were talking on our call the other day, and we were talking about th these three different stories that we all have. And that is our, uh, our public story, you know, the one that everybody knows. Then we have another story, which is that private story. That's the one that when we come in back into the, you know, our homes or wherever we, you know, our environment, home environment, there's a whole nother story going on that the public is not even aware of. And I'm not saying it's a negative thing or anything. It's just a different story that each person is privy of. And then there's another place that we go in terms of story, and that is in terms of our secret story. Things that many of us know about ourselves. We have some of them we've never shared with another person. We are, we're almost trying to keep it from God. Okay. <laughs> but but the reality is, is that everyone has those three levels. And the, the, the interesting thing about that is, is that um, sometimes we can be having a part of our story that for a long time was secret. Okay. And for whatever reason, we decide to bring that up to the next level and maybe even allow whatever that secret thing was to become something public, okay? And that's really, really, really powerful. So in our, in our coaching, we work with, with uh, speakers about how to maybe upgrade and bring things from a deeper level, but they wanna make sure that they're ready to bring those things to a deep, to a, to out into a, another space especially when you're talking about the public. Yeah. So when you, when you were talking about the, you know, the private and bringing it up, there's a difference between bringing it up and bringing it out. Bringing it out is a choice. So you can work yes. on your own story. You can go 3D within yourself. And what happens when you go 3D is you, you look at it from a different perspective and you reframe it. And in reframing it, it loses some of its control over you. You get to make more decisions. It may be leading you to certain uh, behaviors or to avoid certain behaviors. But once you process it, you are more comfortable doing the things. And in the beginning, it's very subtle, but it's yeah. that process of going back and reevaluating and getting very personal 
with yourself. Yes, yes. And the last place we, we're going to go before we go into a, an illustration of um, a short story in which you will hear one, one part of it told in, in two dimensions, and then you will hear a contrasting part told in three dimensions. And here's the last thing we want to say, is that we've learned in our own, in our own stories and how we share and, and the level of transparency that we bring uh, into our stories as we are sharing with others, whether to the one, to the many, or to the masses, we have found out that many people have experienced a tremendous amount of freedom after they have let something they had locked in, <laughs> locked behind those doors with five or six padlocks up and down, and they basically decide they're going to share something, you know, not because they want to, you know, brag or whatever, but because they're ready to make that a part of their entire story. And so there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of freedom there. And people express that when they're able to begin to talk about things on a deeper level, it brings a certain level of healing. So today, Dan and I are gonna share some parts of our story, and some of it's very personal to us, but we wanna share it with you for a redemptive purpose that you might be able to um, see an illustration of maybe a, an area of storytelling that you wanna get involved in and you wanna concentrate and be more intentional about. So Dan uh, is going to share and he's gonna set it up. He's gonna share you an illustration of a two-dimensional story being told and a story being told in 3D or three dimensions. You know, it's, it's interesting, Dwight. I am gonna do that. I'm gonna do it in 2D first. And then I'm going to do it in 3D. But we were talking about being part of Les Brown. In the beginning, we were all 2D speakers. And I've developed so far that the one I struggle with now is the 2D. I want to, I want to automatically go to the 3D. But this is going to be just a part of a story. It's not the whole story. It's just an illustration. So you're not going to get the, all of it, the complete thing. We don't have time for that. Yes. So to set it up, I never go along with my father at all. And my father was an alcoholic, and I think he also maybe suffered from depression. And no matter what I did, no matter how I tried, uh, I just couldn't get through to him. We just couldn't, we just couldn't have the father-son relationship that I wanted to have. So I moved to California, and I've been there 10 years or so. I'm in my, my mid-30s, and I get a phone call. Mm. It's my mother. I got some bad news for you. Your father has cancer. And they say it's terminal. Mm. And what, ha what went on in my mind was, first I felt for him, but I also felt for me because I, I realized that the clock is ticking and uh, I need to do something and I didn't know what to do. So I just said, okay, let me, let me think about this and I'll call you back. The next day, I called my mom and I said, if I send you and dad a ticket, will you come out and visit me in California? You haven't been here. I've been here 10 years. You haven't been here at all. Mm -hmm. She said, sure which surprised me. So I did, I sent him a ticket, but right before it was time to come out, my mom called me and said, I'm not coming, it's just gonna be your dad. So I said, is he gonna be okay? She goes, yeah, I told you, get him a, a nonstop. He get, I'll put him on a plane, you take him off the plane. Where's he gonna go? <laughs> I mean, very matter-of-factly, logically, you know. And so he flew out and we spent a week together, maybe 10 days. And it was 10 days unlike any other 10 days we've ever had in our life. We went to places, we did things, I really enjoyed it. And, and the whole time I was thinking that I wanted some justification. I wanted to know why that I was treated the way I was when I was a kid. I wanted to know how he felt about me, how he thought about me, how he saw me. I wanted to know all that stuff. But I waited around for the right time to, to ask him. And we got to the night before he was going to leave. We had to get up, leave the house at four o'clock in the morning and we're talking and um, I made a decision. I said, you know what, it's not that important. I said, I put, I put aside the way I felt. I said, it's not that important. I'm just gonna enjoy being with him. And he sat back and we were quiet for a moment. And I heard this little voice go, ask him. <laughs> Start on me, is, is there somebody here? And it wasn't, it was just inside of me. It was just a voice. Yeah. And then it's, again, it said, ask him, you promised. And I said, not now, I can't, he's sick. And then it said, ask him, 
You promised when we got bigger, you would ask him why he did all the things he did. And I turned in my mind, all in my mind, and with my father's voice, I said, not now, the man's sick, I can't do it, go away. <laughs> and the little, the little child started to walk away, turned around, looked at me and said, you're just like him. Mm -hmm. That bothered me. So I made a decision that for me and for, for my past and for the inside of me that still needed healing, that the next day, since we were leaving at four in the morning, it would just be me and him on the way to the airport. I was going to ask him. But my 11-year-old son got up and got in the car at four o'clock in the morning, and I'm driving there, and I couldn't ask him. Yeah. We did talk. We did continue to talk like we had all week long, like we had never done in our life until we got to the airport. When we got to the airport, it was just silence. Dad, you need anything? Nah, I'm good. You need to go to the restroom? Nah. If I have to go, I'll go on the plane. Okay. Well, they're calling your seat. I know. Aren't you going to get on the plane? Yeah. Very simple one word. That's all it was. Yeah. And then everybody was on the plane except him. And I thought, is he not feeling well? Is he not? What's going to happen here? And he looked at me and he said to me, thank you. First time I think he's ever said thank you to me in my life. Mm -hmm. He said, I've learned a lot. And that surprised me. You learn from me? I thought you always thought I was an idiot or something like that. And I walked over and I felt like I physically did this. My hands opened and I think what happened is I dropped the baggage I was carrying right there on the floor. Wow. And I think he did the same thing. And then we hugged each other and we said, I love you. And then he walked away. And as he walked away and he walked down the, the gangplank into the plane, he got smaller and smaller in my vision but he grew larger and larger in my heart. And as he was walking down there, my son said, isn't grandpa going to turn around? I said, no, he can't. It's taken mm. everything he's got for him to walk away from us. Mm. So that's 2D. That's what happened that's to me. And that's what happened around me. Yes. Now, let me tell you what happened within me. <clears throat> my father came out to visit me. And as I said, we, we, we never got along. I was feeling anxious. When my mom said, your father has cancer, I felt for him, but I felt just as strong for me. I got to resolve this. I got to know how he feels about me because I don't know how to feel about me. And I sometimes act like him and I don't like it. I don't want to be him. I want to be me, but I don't know who I am. So my father came out. And we had the greatest time. We, we played catch for the first time ever. I'm 36 years old. He's 64 years old. And we're playing catch for the first time. Wow. We went places. We did things. And I'm feeling so great about this. And little by little, the thought of confronting him started to diminish. Mm. And then finally, on the last night that he was there, we're talking. And I was listening to him and I said, I don't need to know. I'm going to let it go. Not even knowing if I really could do that. I think I was, honestly, I think I was lying to myself. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I hear this voice to the side of me go, ask him. What? Who's that? Ask him why he did those things. <laughs> and I looked and I literally in my mind, I didn't turn my head, but I looked that way. And I, because I didn't want my father to know what was going on. And I saw me. And I looked and I said, I can't. I can't. I was pleading with myself. I said, I can't. The man's sick. He's got cancer. Mm -hmm. And the little boy said, You promised when we got bigger, you would ask him why he did those things. And then my father's voice came to me. And I turned to him and I said, I can't ask him. He has cancer. Go away. <laughs> the little boy put his head down, turned away, turned back and looked at me and said, you're just like him. Mm -hmm. Like ice water was poured on me and injected into me at the same time. And I realized that I abandoned myself one more 
time. So I made a decision. The next day I'm going to ask him. I don't care what I got to do. I don't care. What, I don't know where I'm going to get the courage, but I'm going to talk to him. Leaving at four o'clock in the morning, I knew that it would be the, just the two of us, but my 11 year old son decided to go. He got himself up. I didn't even have to wake him up. Mm -hmm. Driving there, we talked about all sorts of things, the scenery, the windmills, how much electricity is generated by them. We had lots of conversation. Then we got to the airport and it stopped. We mm -hmm. were back where we were before he ever came out. Mm -hmm. And I and I would ask him, I would try to open up a conversation. Dad, do you need anything? No, I'm all right. You need to go to the restroom? No, if I do, I'll go on the plane. Hey, Dad, they called your seats. I know. Simple one word answers. And finally, nobody was left. Everybody was on the plane. And I was thinking, you're going to miss your plane. And I looked up and I saw my father with tears in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And he said, thank you. I learned a lot. I cannot express how that felt to me. It was, it was like magical medicine verbiage. Something happened inside of me. Yeah. And I just walked toward him and I felt my hands opening. And I realized that all that stuff that I needed answered, all that stuff I'd been carrying around my whole life, I just had to let it go. Yeah. And I reached out and he reached out and we hugged each other. Mm. And I said, I love you. <laughs> he said, I love you. Yeah. And without saying anything else, he turned and walked away. He started walking down the gateway, and every step he got a little smaller, a little smaller, and a little smaller in my vision. But he grew larger and larger and larger in my heart. My son said, isn't Grandpa going to turn around? I said, no. It's taken everything he's got to walk away from us. Mm. And with that statement, I understood him more. Mm. Now, I didn't trust it. And I looked for ways for it to go away. I, I prepared myself. But when I called him when he got home, we talked. Mm. I didn't just say, about how, what's the house, how's the weather? I couldn't even ask him anymore, how's your job? Because it couldn't work. So I could ask him about the weather. What are you doing? We had real conversations for exactly yeah. two months until the day he passed away. Beautiful. Woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> So that is great. Go I gotta ahead. say, I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta confess a little bit right here. I, there was a point in time when I couldn't do that. Yes. It, it, I had to work with it. I had to work with it. I had to work with it. In yeah. fact, we did a little trial run through this morning, and Dwight will tell you that I didn't get through it quite as easily as I did just now. Yeah. yeah. But I have come to a level of of understanding and appreciation for my father. And yeah. then when I see my father in myself, I don't hate it anymore. I actually mm -hmm. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I actually get a moment of joy, you know, because yeah. I am a descendant of somebody and I learned from that person. Right. And I learned some good stuff that was blocked out by a lot of mental garbage that I was carrying around. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Good job, Dan. You know, the, uh, the, the thing that, that I'm taking away from it immediately mm -hmm. is that when you shared uh, the first time, if I could compare the two, I heard you tell the story. Mm -hmm. But of course, the second time, I not only heard you, but I heard and felt you share that story, okay? It, it allowed me to begin to think about my own story and the father piece and the whole, that whole issue. I mean, we can spend the rest of the time talking about that, but we're not. But but I just want you to know, I was able to observe that contrast. And of course, that was intentional, right? Yeah. And it was, it was yes, it absolutely was, because if you only heard me, and I'm talking to someone and trying my best to persuade them or influence yeah. them. And remember, right. whenever you're speaking, whether you're selling or whatever, you are looking to influence behavior. Yeah. And you heard me, you could walk away after hearing me and leave everything I said behind. Mm -hmm. But if you felt me, that's not so easy to do. Right. It sticks that's with right. you and it stays with you and, and you carry it with you. And then you start to think about your life yeah. and what are the comparisons, not to the particulars of what I said, 
Right. But to the feelings that I expressed, and when have you felt that way? That's right. <laughs> so it go, it's like that, that saying. So years later, after hearing your story in 3D, of course, I may not remember the details of your story, but I'll never forget how your story made me feel. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that feelings is everything, but I think it's a part of the whole transformation process. And so you, you really uh, dynamically uh, illustrated that. Uh, any, any last thing you want to say before well, we go? I want to say, so, uh, my story was, was um, what may, people may consider to be heavy or negative, and, and that's not what I want to use my story for. But yeah. uh, Peter Guber, in his book, Tell to Win, he talks about Muhammad Ali wanted desperately to get the greatest made. And he had a group of people in a big conference room. And he was trying to tell them why he wanted them to put their money into this movie. Mm -hmm. They weren't responding. So he asked everybody to stand up. And he went through and he had them all boxing and he had them all throwing punches. And they were, they were wearing suits and ties and they were sweating. And he was telling them the routine he went through and what it took for him to become the champion. And by doing it, they got it. They funded this film and it was made. So it can be wow. used in, in all kinds of different contexts. Yeah, got it, got it. Beautiful. Okay, so we're gonna go to another place now, um, dealing with uh, another uh, portion that we wanna share with, with the uh, Zoom audience today and the, and the champion, the comeback champion uh, summit audience. And that is, we're gonna talk about another area that we work with speakers on in, in, the, in the storytelling uh, genre. And that is how to leverage a defining moment, mm -hmm. how to leverage your defining moments. And before we go into an illustration, you know, defining moments, and here's how we kind of frame that. And again, it's another quote. And yes, we heard Les Brown share this quote before, but, mm -hmm. but that's, that's what training is all about. You know, we, we learn, we earn, we pass it on. So to hear him share it, now we take it to another generation because I'm going to share with you. He said that Denzel Washington said in life that there is the moment and then there is after the moment in which nothing is ever the same again. Think about that. As you look at your life, as you think back on the, the things that you've gone through in life, clearly you could, if you give it, give it enough time, you could probably come up with two or three different defining moments that were not just moments that kind of impacted you, but they were moments that literally changed your life. In other words, there was before the moment and that whatever that, however that's described or understood, then there is that impactful moment. And all of us have some of that in our life. Some of us got those kind of moments and experiences in our family of origin and in our childhood, things that literally changed us from that moment on. Okay, and then of course, the other piece is there's after the moment in which it's a contrast to before because something changes and the genie never gets put back in the bottle or the toothpaste back in the tube. That's, that's exactly right. You know, with my story, I walked out of there doubting it. I, I walked out of there trying to fight it. Yeah. Not trusting it at all. But you know what? <laughs> it was real. And, mm -hmm. and it changed. Uh, that was 26 years ago. Yeah, 20, and, and 26, was, that's right. 26 years later, you're still remembering it, still experiencing it. Now that's that's the heavy part there, like you did earlier. Still living by it. Say again? Still living by it. That's right, it's that's right. my day-to-day -day life. Yeah, that's right. So clearly, that, that moment at the airport, and that, not necessarily that, just that moment, that visit by your father, which was the final visit, mm -hmm. did something that changed the course and destiny of your life in terms of how you process your father and your experience with your father. And that, that's a powerful thing. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna then share, I'm gonna share um, a defining moment. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually share two defining moments. Okay, remember, we talked about defining moment as in life, there is the moment, there is before the moment, there is the moment of whatever that event was, and then there is after that 
season or that event that takes place and things are dramatically different and they remain that way probably for, through the course and destiny of your entire life. So I've been sharing my story for at least a good, a good 32 to 33 years because I came out of an addiction cycle about 34 years ago. And shortly after that, I got to the point to where I was healed enough uh, to be able to tell my story, give my testimony. I was doing it in churches and places where I could go and share my testimony. And then I ran into Mr. Les Brown again in 2004, and I was able to take my story to a whole nother level in terms of getting the coaching, getting the feedback, because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. And so I've been, had a lot of experiences sharing my story. So I'm going to pick out just two events, and I want to basically um, freeze the frame on those two events, and then, of course, make the point about um, a defining moment. All right? Okay. So the first is, is that, um, I, and I, as I share my story, I talk about being married to my childhood sweetheart and our early beginnings and how we, I was moving up the success ladder and everything looked like, you know, we were on our way to the top and, you know, had a lot of possessions and things. In other words, life was good. I was making money. And I remember that one day, it was the summer of 1979. And I remember I was at a friend's house and then her friend came in and he had this you know, little bag and he pulled out this contraption that I later learned was a freebase pipe, okay, for smoking cocaine. Um, so he took out this pipe and he took out the little container and poured this cocaine on the screens of this pipe, okay. And I remember him putting the heat to it, taking in that big chest full of smoke and he blew the smoke out. And I looked at that and I was mesmerized. And then he turned and offered me some. And then in, in that moment, I had a decision to make. I could say yes, or could I, I could have just said no. It was Warren Buffett who said, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. And truer words were never spoken because I took that hit of cocaine blew the smoke out, and in a spirit of invincibility and arrogance and pride, I thought to myself, I can handle this drug. Well, it wasn't long before uh, that, that became the, the, the obsession of my life, before, because before that year ended, I was hopelessly addicted to cocaine. Every waking minute was consumed with how I would get and use this drug. And it wasn't long before the toothpick castle we had built began to crumble room by room. First, the, the cars were gone, and then the house was gone. Then the real estate business, the brokerage firm. And then in 1981, I did the unthinkable, walked out on my wife and children and moved 500 miles up the coast of California and landed on the streets of Oakland using, selling, and caught up in just a crazy, maniacal, maniacal lifestyle. Okay. Now, my question, Dan, to you. Mm -hmm. Could you recognize, and, and to you that, that heard the story, yes. could you recognize an explanation or a picture of before the moment? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Before the moment, life was good. Yes. Like you, like you often say, you know, uh, you were headed to the top. That's right. You had you, you had control of your life. Oh my goodness! You had control, yeah. and it yes. was all in order. Mm -hmm. Until Got it. Absolutely, absolutely. Good, great, great. You were paying attention. Thank you for that. Okay, <clears throat> and then I talked about that moment. Okay, and clearly it was a moment. You you know, and you remember me sharing that that moment at that at that friend's house and taking that first hit. And every, every drug addict and every alcoholic, many of them can remember the first time they got drunk or the first time that they got high. So that moment took place, but there was power in that moment because you know, my next question to you was, could you see the contrast between the before 
the moment and after the moment. Yeah, after the moment, uh, you, you, you lost control. You said you were helplessly addicted. You didn't say you were addicted. You didn't say it was a choice. You said you were yeah. helplessly addicted. Absolutely, absolutely. So, okay, so let, let's, let's go to another defining moment because these two, def these two defining moments are literally bookends. And when we talk about stories and we're using defining moments, Oftentimes, a great way to, to, after you have laid the foundation for your story, oftentimes uh, a defining moment is a good way to transition into what we call the journey of your story. And some of you mm -hmm. might call that the body of your story, but it's a great way to make a transition. And then as you go through the journey or the body of your story, oftentimes you've got to bring you got to bring that, that plane in for a landing, okay? Because it can't be the never ending okay. story, okay? And so, uh, so, so, so I'm gonna go to that other bookend. I'm gonna go to that resolution, uh, defining moment that really changed some things in my life. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was after I had came from Northern California back down to Southern California. And I've been gone for like five and a half years um, separated from my wife and children. And I remember standing at the airport, Ontario International Airport, nothing but the clothes I was wearing on my back, lost everything. Standing there wondering who's going to be there for me. The truth was no one owed me anything. And I remember looking and coming around the corner in this old Chevy Nova car was my wife. The woman I had walked out on five and a half years earlier, leaving her to fend for herself, her, and the kids. And what I thought about was, is that at that moment is she should have done a drive-by. But she didn't do a drive-by because mm -hmm. when she could have chosen to hate, she chose love. Mm -hmm. She could have chosen revenge. She chose to forgive. And it's been said that forgiveness is like the sweet fragrance that a rose leaves on the foot that crushed it. I got in that car, we left that airport, headed down a long, incredibly long road to restoration. Mm -hmm. And I remember I struggled with that addiction. Okay, remember I got in that car, still an addict, still wanting to go get me a hit of cocaine somewhere. And I struggled with that addiction for another two and a half months until what I like to say it was the third Friday in June of 1986. I had been out getting high with a friend all that day, smoking and using drugs and running to and fro, trying to get us a hit from this place and that. And we ended up at uh, my sister's house and she was out of town. She's the one that kind of helped me to get from Northern to Southern California. And, but across the street was a, was a place where drugs were being sold, drugs were smoked. So I was over there getting high with my friend and it got down to where I didn't have any more drugs. And I remember begging my nephew for just one hit of crack. Please, just give me one hit. And, he, and, and I had to have just the most pathetic look on my face. But he gave me that one hit. I remember taking it, blew the smoke out, turned and hit it towards the door. Told my friend that I'd been with all day. I said, man, that's it. I'm through. And I think he thought I meant, oh, well, we're through for the night. We'll hook up tomorrow, bro. And he took off and went on his way. But what he didn't realize that there was something going on down on the inside. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was beginning to deal with the shame of what I had been for the past seven years. I was beginning to deal with the, the, the hurt, the anger, the betrayal. All of that began to flood in on me. And I walked across that street, opened the door to my sister's house, and I literally collapsed on her hallway floor. And I remember rolling around on that floor crying out to a power greater than me, crying out to the only God that could deliver me, saying, I want to be free. Mm. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how long I lay on that floor, but here's what I do know, that when I got up and stood up, I had a sense down on the inside that the chains of habit had been broken. And from that day until this day, I never used drugs again. My life was put back together with my family. 
is restored. I've been back home for 34 years, been married to my childhood sweetheart for a total of 48 years. And to God be the glory for that. So truly, defining moments in our lives can make a difference. Wow. You know, I, I've heard that story so many times. Oh, really? And it still, it still has an impact on me. But, Absolutely. Um, you know, what, and we could talk forever, but one of the things yeah. that's working against us today is the clock. Yeah, that's right. It goes to the end of our thing. So we need to wrap this up and we need to uh, Got it. talk to the listeners about how they can get a little bit of this. What do we have for them? Got it. Got it. Okay, great. Well, one of the things that we, we're doing and many of the other speakers are doing as well, we want to offer something to those of you that are taking your time to listen to this 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 video, to watch this Zoom rather. And um, and the, the way in which we want to get that to you is going to be um, a, what we call our life experience resume. We're going to send you a, a, a piece that allows you to begin to work on filling out your life experience resume. Because mm -hmm. Dan and I use that tool as a source of content for working with those that are putting their um, stories together. And it'll be a, just an invaluable source to you and a resource. Also, you will get, um, you will also get a, a training that we did on the life experience resume and how you can leverage that gift or that tool. So we're gonna get that all, all to you. And the way to do that is, we're gonna need you, hopefully you got your pen handy. We're gonna need you to text the word Champ, you know, the short version of champion. Okay, <laughs> text the word champ, C H A M P, that's it, to the number 55469. Champ, to the number 55469, and you will have information on how you can redeem and how we can get uh, that life experience resume and that training uh, on the life experience resume that Dan and I put together. It's going to be very helpful to you going forward in establishing and beginning to work on your uh, signature story, your three-dimensional story. Yeah. And you to become a three-dimensional storyteller as well. And, and this is a tool that you can use in the privacy of your own home. Um, it has worked for a lot of people. You can you can work with us, but even if you don't work with us, it's got value. Exactly. Usually, what happens is it starts out as a, an inventory of life experiences with gaps in them. Yeah. And then people think about it and then they start filling in the gaps. Absolutely. And they start thinking about why did I write this down? And what happened? Why is what's the significance? Why did I remember that? Why did I not remember that? And yeah. they, they write down a little thing about, you know, this is well, this is what happened. This is what was going on. And That's then right. out of that, when they look at it, they just step back and they go, I have a story. That's right. Another story. So we want you all to get it. So Dwight, one more time. They, they That's right. That's right. You're going to text the word CHAMP to the number 55469. Again, CHAMP to the number 55469. All right. Okay, Dan, I think, I think we can wrap it up I here. I just want to say to everybody out there that's watching, we greatly appreciate you spending your time with us. And we hope you've got something of value out of this. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you.